So in the early 1800s, President Thomas Jefferson published a manifesto entitled Observed Properties of Modern American Propaganda. In this work, Jefferson describes a phenomenon gaining traction in the United States that came to be known as spoon baby syndrome. The term spoon baby refers to any individual who allows themselves to be spoon-fed ideas by those in positions of power. As the spoon baby becomes indoctrinated, these individuals shift into a state of factual denial and obey creeds founded on opinion rather than truth. Jefferson hypothesized that several important American documents that he helped write, such as the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, might one day be twisted in order to support rhetoric in direct contradiction to the original tenements of these works. Americans, so bent on upholding ideology and nationalist identity, would fall prey to charismatic leaders intent on subverting democracy, freedom, and common sense. I grew up in a town where many people were spoon babies. Of these individuals, those who did not leave the town became stuck there and believed there was little they could do to improve their situation. This closed-minded mentality bred intolerance and an inability to reason with people of different cultural or political backgrounds. When I came to college, I experienced something similar. During my freshman year, I was criticized because my beliefs were too old-fashioned. I used to be the only liberal around, but now I was being branded conservative by like-minded individuals. To them, it wasn't that I wasn't liberal, it was that I wasn't liberal enough. I began to question who I was as a person. Had years of small town propaganda done their damage? Had I become the spoon baby that I'd always fought against? I was in flux, battling two opposing ideologies that didn't mesh. Nobody cared about the struggle, they just wanted me to reinforce their opinions instead of me asserting my own. It doesn't matter if a Nazi does this or a privileged college student does this. This is called censorship and is the enemy of civilized discussion. I asked myself what I could do to fight against this breakdown in dialogue. I began to study propaganda and realized that the conflicts I was experiencing were cropping up on a global scale. The verdict misinformation has become the new normal. As evidenced by our current political climate, fake news can go a long way in influencing public opinion. Social media has allowed anyone to become an influencer, leading to a democratized form of journalism that is more opinionated than subjective. People are falling prey to their own worst instincts and becoming spoon babies to themselves. When one's own opinion is more appealing than a fact, why would anyone tell the truth? Filmmaker Werner Herzog developed a concept in his films known as the ecstatic truth. This term refers to the complete truth of a moment, something that often cannot be captured through the relay of facts alone. Herzog incorporates fictional moments into his documentaries and nonfiction moments into his narrative work. By fusing facts and lies, Herzog creates films that are more true than reality. In describing this concept, he makes a noted distinction between facts and truth in that fact creates norms and truth illumination. Fake news plays into this idea, tweaking existing information in ways that reinforce preconceived notions people have about one another. What happens when you want to change a predetermined notion rather than play into it. This is where appropriation becomes relevant. In the short story, The Appropriation of Cultures by Percival Everett, a black man in the South buys a pickup truck sporting a large Confederate flag decal. He adopts the flag as a black power symbol and urges all his black friends to buy Confederate paraphernalia. As the symbol becomes increasingly associated with the African-American cause, fewer white people are seen sporting the rebel mark. In this way, a racist totem is stripped of all meaning and used to support a more inclusive message. 
The appropriation of cultures presents a world in which hate symbols can be taken away from oppressors. Our current society is not so righteous. For decades, hate groups have taken traditionally apolitical symbols and perverted them to dramatic effect. Such instances of appropriation are known as meme hacking, a term which refers to any alteration to a symbol or idea which changes the original meaning of the artwork or concept. This is not a new phenomenon. In 1920, the Nazi party adopted the Indian swastika for use on their flags and uniforms. The swastika has a long religious history and represents goodwill and prosperity in many Eastern cultures, but it came to be representative of hate as a result of Nazi influence. Thus far, fake news and meme hacking have led to a dramatic increase in individuals afflicted with spoon baby syndrome. This has charged everyday language with divisive rhetoric. Things do not have to be this way. As a collective society, it is our duty to dismantle the fake news apparatus and establish a post-post-truth world. If lies have become more relevant than facts, what place do facts have in fighting lies? A grassroots propaganda initiative is the easiest way to reestablish political equilibrium. Positive propaganda must adopt the methods of fake news while keeping truth in one's message a main priority, effectively creating a system of progress based on Herzog's notion of the ecstatic truth. So, aren't I just advocating for people to lie to one another? I struggled with this question myself until I started to think about the situation in terms of game theory. Game theory is the application of mathematical principles to predict behavioral patterns and outcomes. A classic example of game theory is a situation known as the prisoner's dilemma. In this scenario, two prisoners from the same mob are made a deal by the police. The police want to bust at least one of the prisoners on a serious charge so they offer freedom to the prisoner who rats out the other. The prisoner who is ratted out will serve three years in prison. If both prisoners talk, they each serve two years. If neither prisoner talks, they only serve one year apiece. Game theory posits that it is in each prisoner's best interest to betray the other because this option offers the greatest reward, freedom. Although the low-risk situation, where each prisoner is only in prison for one year, is the safest, it is not nearly as enticing as absolution. This situation can be applied to the problem of fake news. Negative people use fake news and thus have an immediate advantage over positive people who do not. What we need to see in the world is a situation in which both sides choose to defect. If both negative people and positive people use fake news, the initiatives would cancel each other out, and one or more players would have to adopt different methods in order to thrive again. Positive propaganda must become as relevant as negative propaganda. Propaganda as a whole is to be eliminated entirely. So how does one create such propaganda? For help with this, let's get back to Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson used a few basic principles of propaganda when he crafted the landmark document you all know as the Declaration of Independence. In his essay about propaganda, Jefferson lists five such principles which are applicable to the modern day. Principle number one, propagandists must have access to intelligence concerning current events and public opinion. In today's society, it is almost impossible to avoid the news. The viral nature of social media and the internet have allowed everyone to comment on current events in real time. Whether it is the latest Trump scandal or terrorist attacks in the Middle East, one must always be reacting to something. Principle number two, 
propaganda must be planned and executed by only one authority. Social media represents the ultimate expression of this ideal. All users are in charge of how they express their personal brand of propaganda online. Since everyone has differing opinions about social issues, this has the potential to saturate the market with, with diverse points of view. This is imperative for the sustained resistance effort of an inclusive society where communications media are not bogged down by singular corporatized viewpoints. Principle number three, credibility alone should determine whether propaganda output is true or false. When divisive politics threaten to upend democratic society with mean-spirited falsehoods, one cannot rely on facts alone for salvation. While maintaining Herzog's notion of the aesthetic truth, one can tell lies which unite rather than divide. In doing this, um, positive propaganda must adopt the methods of fake news while keeping truth in one's message a main priority. Principle number four, propaganda must affect the enemy's policy. The current enemy is not a singular entity but a mass of political extremists on all sides who seek to divide democratic society. Take the tools they use and implement them for your own benefit. Just as in the short story, The Appropriation of Cultures, this shift in power might force these oppressors to adopt different methods in order to thrive again. If everyone became involved in this appropriation of evil, falsehoods would cease to have any impact. Principle number five, to be perceived, propaganda must evoke the interest of an audience and be transmitted through an attention-getting communications medium. Social technology has allowed falsehoods to spread like wildfire through the public consciousness of the internet. The development of news feed platforms such as Facebook have charged everyday language with divisive rhetoric. These platforms could instead be used by concerned citizens to produce positive-minded content which appeals to a broad variety of people. So, I have a confession. I've lied to you. Thomas Jefferson never coined the term spoon baby. I did. He also never wrote a manifesto on propaganda. All of that information came from chief Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels. Would you have listened as intently, though, if you knew the true sources of this content? Thomas Jefferson is a well-respected American founding father, while I'm a college student and Joseph Goebbels was a war criminal. How does it make you feel to know that you've been fed lies? This is the way you should feel every day. <laughs> when you watch the news or scroll through your social media feed. We are all spoon babies, but we don't have to be. Let this talk serve as a template for those of you who want to follow my lead and start telling the truth by lying to people. In this talk, I adhere to all five propaganda principles, which I mentioned earlier. So let's break it down. Number one, I research past and present propaganda practices, as well as current trends regarding fake news and social media. Number two, I planned and executed this talk by myself through TEDx UNC Asheville. Number three, I determine which parts of this talk should be factual or fabricated. The aesthetic truth I wanted to relay emerged as a result. Four, I affected the enemy's policy by urging others to create fake news for themselves. And finally, I use an attention-getting communications medium known as a TED Talk. Few things 
are better than that. Thank you. <laughs>